morning South Calgary and welcome to our worship time. Um, just before we begin our, our actual worship, um, just wanted to reflect a little bit on what's been ongoing in Acts and the preaching that has been happening and the hope that has been preached um, through Jesus' death and resurrection. And that is what Paul and Silas and Peter wanted the people to know about is our salvation through our relationship and our faith in Christ and that with that we have hope we have an eternal life um, because of that hope and at the end of the day Jesus is all we need that's what we need to focus on as we continue to deepen our relationships with Jesus as we continue to learn that um, he is our hope and he is all we need. Let's begin our worship time. <clears throat> Jesus, hope of the nation. Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light in the darkness. Jesus, truth in each circumstance. Heaven's light on earth Yeah. 
Lord, we believe. Lord, we believe. Lord, we
Good morning everybody. We are going to continue with our sermon series in the book of Acts. But before we uh, move forward, uh, bow your heads, uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I just want to pray that you would, you would uh, speak to us, give us attention, give us focus. Your word is uh, so beautiful, so many uh, important things we can learn with your word and I pray in this moment Father that uh, you would uh, speak to us reveal your mind reveal your heart to us I pray Father that we will learn new things about you in this moment in your holy name I pray Amen all right so last week Lee talked about how God can use difficult situations and crisis to accomplish his purposes. You know, out of a crisis, God can do powerful and beautiful things. And how does he do this? You know, through his message and using people like Paul and his friends. Uh, the, the, the message of Jesus Christ has, you know, powerful effects. Uh, it was transforming the whole world. In chapter 17, verse 6, Paul and his companions, they were described as men who were turning the world upside down. I love that verse. And uh, what, would, uh, uh, what I would like to explore to you uh, today is how you can be this agent of change, how you also can be a person turning the world upside down, you know, and be part of this God's process of transformation. I, I would like to do that by giving you three words, you know, three words that I want you to remember we are going to get there. We are going to um, talk about these three words soon. So, uh, where are we exactly in Acts? We are in the second part of the second missionary journey, where Paul, Silas, Timothy, and occasionally Luke traveled together, revisiting some of the places they had passed in the first missionary journey. And the objective of this trip was to be strengthening the churches. We can read that in, in um, chapter 15, verse 41. That's what they wanted. But the thing is, even though they had planned a trip, the itinerary, if we see the second missionary journey itinerary, we'll notice that uh, they actually went way farther than the first journey. Uh, remember uh, last week, uh, we, we heard that Paul uh, had a vision of a Macedonian man saying, come on over to Macedonia and help us in verse 9, uh, chapter 16, verse 9. But the thing is, God led them to travel new roads, you know, to experience new places, you know, new cities. When we follow God, you know, it's an adventure, it's a constant adventure. So they had passed by places like Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and they had, you know, difficult times. They faced persecution, but they had great results. Like in Berea, for instance, one of my favorite cities in the New Testament, uh, they, they were pretty special, the Bereans. You know why? You know, uh, verse 11, uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 11 tells us why. It says, Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness, and examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. You know, they were people that knew how to read their Bibles. They wanted to learn. They wanted to know the truth. They didn't just trust Paul because he was, you know, presenting some interesting thoughts. They wanted to check if what he was saying was according to the scriptures. If we, if we had more people <clears throat> like this today, you know, with this determination, with this kind of determination, we definitely would have less false teachings or people being deceived by false teachings. Uh, in Berea, <clears throat> the Bible tells us <clears throat> that many people had accepted Jesus Christ. What happened then? Well, persecution again. And the brothers in Berea had to immediately send Paul to another city. And he ended up going to Athens, while Silas and Timothy, they had remained in Berea for a little longer. So this is where our passage starts today on verse 16. Uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 16 tells us, While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was 
greatly distressed, greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And this is something I want to, you know, highlight for you this morning here. This is a, an important, there is a, an important principle here uh, to be applied in Christian life. No, no question that in Christian life, we have many moments of joy and peace, you know, but there are sufferings as well. Uh, and, and this is a good example of a, of a kind of suffering, you know, uh, a common kind, actually, that we face in Christian life. When Paul saw a city that was far from God, a city that was spiritually lost, following myth and fantasies, fake gods, philosophies, you know, intellectualism, uh, you know, that touched him inside. He, he, he was deeply affected inside. Um, and, and Paul, he was not just, you know, like distressed. He was greatly distressed when he saw that kind of, of lifestyle. So do you see, today, we don't like to suffer. We don't want to be emotionally distressed. No, no one likes that. No, maybe if we had a modern psychologist talking to Paul, he could say something like, don't bother with, with that, Paul. You know, don't, don't, don't let this thing take your peace away. You know, do, do something that you enjoy doing. Uh, you know, don't, don't get upset and frustrated, distressed over this. And in fact, it would be much better for Paul if he would not care. If he, would, uh, if he would not care, he would not suffer great distress and he would be emotionally well, everything would be fine. But many times in the Bible, we see that certain people, you know, men, women, youth of God, they felt this deep sadness. And then God called them and sent them into a mission. For instance, remember Nehemiah. When he had heard that Jerusalem was in ruins, you know, he wept for days and he prayed. And he was in great distress, uh, 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 like Paul. Then God was able to use him to restore the walls of Jerusalem and bring encouragement to the people there. You know, when, when you care intensely, God uses this. To accomplish his purpose so the first step for a christian with a mission is to care you know is to be touched inside uh, that's that's why the first word i want you to remind today is the word care the word care you know you need to learn how to care you know let god uses this feeling of maybe, you know, uh, um, uh, like Paul, you know, great distress uh, to be motivated, to be motivating you to act. You know, you allow yourself to be acting when you um, care for others. You care for uh, the things that God cares. So, but I would like to ask you, how do you feel when you look to the world today? When you look to the world today, and I like, how, how do you feel? How much bothered you get when you face this lack of God in our society? Or maybe uh, uh, people that, that you may know. Uh, you may, if you feel nothing, you know, maybe there is a chance that you are experiencing some, something called apathy or lack of empathy for what God is uh, concerned. When, when you have this kind of pain, you know, this push us to pray more, to intercede more, you know, to, to uh, uh, do things, to act when we have to. Um, okay, what that feeling had caused in Paul? What was the result of that feeling? Because he had, he had cared, he, he was caring. You know, in verse 17, we see uh, what happened. Uh, verse 17 says, so he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happen to be there. 
he could not be silent. You know, he was reasoning with others. You know, he was saying, you know, use your brain, use your reason. You know, you are people that like to think. Look carefully to the scriptures. You know, do, do you see Jesus here? Do you see God's plan right here? And, and, and Paul was, was talking to Jews and, and God-fearing Greeks. Uh, so people that were supposed to know the scriptures. And also he was talking to people that maybe had never heard of God and Jesus in the marketplace, um, right? Um, and, and, he was, and he was persistent. He was spoke day by day. But let's give a, a closer look to uh, who were these people, the Athenians. And, uh, and I want you to notice that, you know, how similar these Athenians uh, they, they were uh, to our society today. On verse 18, it tells us, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They, say, they said this because Paul was preaching. What? He was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, May we know what is this teaching, uh, what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. They wanted to know more, yes, you know, because they were curious uh, about something new, um, but they also wanted to judge Paul's teaching. The Areopagus was not just a place, it was a council as well. And they wanted to know if this teaching uh, could be something supported by them. You know, uh, they, uh, they had the power to, you know, kick Paul out of the town and, and if, if they wanted to. And in verse 21, Luke make, uh, makes a, a comment with uh, this sarcastic tone uh, about these people here. In verse 21, he says, you know, all Athenians... And foreigners who live there spend their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. We see how much emphasis they had in this philosophical intellectualism. You know, uh, like I said, there are many similarities with our society today. For instance, verse 18 mentions these two groups of philosophers, Epicureans and Stoic philosophers. Epicureans uh, and Stoics, they, they were pretty much the opposite of each other. You know, Epicureans uh, were after pleasure. They were after, you know, pursuing happiness, you know, sensualism. Also, you know, that, that idea of absence of pain and fear leads to the greatest pleasure. You know, avoid stress, avoid pain, avoid conflict. You know, just do the things you like to do. You know, for instance, they, they didn't like politics uh, because it could lead to frustrations and ambitions which can directly conflict with the Epicurean pursuit for peace of mind. You know, they were like uh, kind of a Zen uh, people. And, and, and this this line of thought is very much alive in our days as well, uh, also in the church. Uh, and the Stoic philosophers uh, were the opposite. They taught that we should be indifferent uh, to pleasure or pain, uh, control your emotions, control your fears. You know, endure hardships uh, with with uh, you know a cool mind. You know that problem doesn't affect me. You know, like I needed to keep going my life, you know, um, and, you know, have a cool mind uh, when you face, you know, some, some difficulties and problems. They were also pantheistics. You know, God is this power in nature, the universe. Uh, there's not a personal God. Uh, you can't not, you cannot have a relationship with God because the, the world is God. You know, pan, everything, theo, God, you know, uh, everything is God. Um, uh, even that... Um, there are actually interesting things uh, in both a school of thoughts. In, Paul day, in Paul's days, uh, they were more like a system of pride. You know? you know, this is the way you should live to obtain the ultimate joy and happiness. You know, my ways of thinking is enlightened, you know, is uh, more intellectual than yours. And, and that's why when they listen to Paul's teaching, their reaction is this. Who is this babbler? 
you know, this empty talker, you know, with these irrational, foolish words, you know, picking thoughts here and there, you know, actually, this is not different from uh, of, of how people uh, react when we bring Jesus into a conversation. Even that they don't say it to our face, but sometimes it can be felt. And Paul, in, in his letter to the Corinthians, he had mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, he, he said, you know, but we preach Christ crucified. That message of Christ crucified, it was like a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Greeks, to the Gentiles. And, and there is a, an interesting book written by uh, Leslie uh, Newbegin. I think I'm pronouncing his name right, Newbegin, uh, and um, uh, a British reformed theologian, missionary in India. And he wrote a book called Foolishness of the Greeks, um, the Gospel and the Western Culture. And in this book, he compares the, the Greek culture in this chapter 17 that we are reading to our modern Western culture. Uh, he points uh, to many similarities. There is many similarities between the Western cultures and, and the Greek culture. And uh, like the inte intellectualism, you know, the pride, the plural, plural, pluralism, um, the, the, the philosophy behind you know, many of our actions uh, today. And, and he brings this question, what would it mean to confront this culture? this Western culture, our society today, with the gospel. What would it mean to confront the, this culture with the gospel? Uh, what would be uh, involved in this encounter between the gospel and, and modern science, you know, politics, economics, you know, and finally he talks about the task that the church has in bringing about this missionary encounter. The gospel transforms not just people, but also, you know, whole families, societies, nations. The, 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 the gospel is very powerful. And God is still in the business of transforming lives. And he still uses people like Paul, like you, like me, uh, um, people who cares, to be an agent of transformation. And they, you know, brought Paul before this council in the uh, Areopagus, and Paul spoke, you know. And this brings me to uh, the second word I want you to uh, remember this morning. The word speak. The word speak. If you want to part, to be part of this process of transformation, to be an agent of change, you know, uh, change in your life, change in your family, your church, your society, our world, you know, you have to speak. You have to speak. You have to act. You have uh, to reason with others. You know, like Peter wrote you, that, that we needed to always be prepared to give a, an answer of the hope we have in us. And, and Paul's speech is, is brilliant, you know, it's intelligent, uh, you know, it's direct, it's clear. And he speaks that uh, between verse 22 and 31 on, verse, uh, on chapter 17. And he sees that the Greeks were so concerned with religion that they had a statue of, of, uh, uh, for each deity they worshipped. They were so concerned to forget any deity that they had made a statue for the unknown God, just in case they would forget something, someone. And, and Paul uses this as a, as a conversation starter in, in, his, in his speech there, you know, to call their attention. And um, Paul talks about um, several things. He starts in a very polite way, respectful way. He doesn't want to attack them, to condemn. He wants want, want them to listen. And, and Paul talks uh, about God, that God is the Lord of the whole universe, uh, the whole world. He does not need uh, to live in a temple built by human hands. He created humanity to have a, a relationship with him. He talks about things, he uses uh, uh, quotes of some Greek poets. Um, Paul wanted them to understand, so he wanted to connect with them. He's using uh, some resources that they would feel familiar with. And even that we see that he's being friendly. 
right? When we read his speech, we can see that he's being super friendly. He does not, but, but even that he's friendly, he does not avoid saying what he needs to be said. You know, he's clearly saying, you need to change. You need to repent. God is commanding, you know, in verse 30, to all people everywhere to repent. That's what Paul says. So, um, do you see, we would love to see the world changing, right? We would love to see revival. We pray for revival. We would love uh, to see the church full of people worshiping the Lord. We would love to see those things. We would love to see some people becoming followers of Jesus Christ, people from our families, people around us, maybe uh, in our work environment. But uh, if we uh, do not speak, how can we experience any change? We need to speak, even that we may experience rejection. And, and when Paul spoke about Jesus and his resurrection, Paul's, Paul's speech was ended, you know, uh, which was something very illogical. They had gods with superpowers, but they could not understand a god that could bring someone back from the dead. They had a hard time with that. And they were, you know, like our society, lost within their own intellectualism. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, uh, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor he can know them because they are spiritually discerned. The result of Paul's speech could look like a total disaster. It was different than the other cities that he had passed by. Few men and women uh, believed, you know, but that was enough. Uh, verse 34 mentions um, some names, um, Dionysius, Damaris, and Paul could very well, you know, feel discouraged. After all, you know, it's very, it's very hard when you speak and you were not heard. I remember some years ago driving some youth to Camp Caroline. In the car we were talking and, and I had said to one of the youth, wow, you know, one day you are going to be a youth pastor. And he replied, you know, oh, no way. Uh, I, I don't like to speak and no one listens. Um, you know, and I said, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's hard indeed, yeah. So I, I think that Paul was a normal human being, you know, he had feelings too. He was probably getting tired of, you know, fighting and maybe, you know, speaking and speaking and, and not be heard. And um, so he, he left Athens and ended up going to Corinth. And this is the, the third, third word I would like you to remember, you know, the word is persist. Even when there is, uh, when uh, there is challenges, persist. You know, we need to keep going. We need to keep speaking. When things are easy, that's easy. But the idea of persisting is keep going even when things are hard. Even when you are facing obstacles, you persist. Even when you don't like it. Even if you, you feel you, 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 you don't feel that you, you, you are you know, up to the challenge there, but you you persist, you keep, uh, you need to persist. I think Paul uh, had, you know, uh, some difficulties, you know, some emotional challenges also. Because in, in chapter uh, 18, verse 9 and uh, 10, the Lord has spoken to Paul. He came and encouraged Paul with a vision. I think this is so special. You know, God came and gave this vision to Paul to, you know, cheer him up, to encourage him. Look what happened in verse 9 of chapter 18. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. And he said this, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Don't be silent. For I am with you. And no one is going to attack 
or harm you because I have many people in this city. God meant, um, I have many people in the city that need, uh, they, 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 they needed to hear about my son Jesus and the hope and the good news that he brings. So keep speaking, persist, don't give up, don't be silent, don't be afraid of speaking, persist. So here are the three words I want you to remember today. Care, speak, and persist. Care, you know, you needed to care. You need to let God use this feeling to motivate you to act. And how can you act? You need to speak. You need to open your mouth and, and reason with others and talk to others. You know, share the things that God, you know, did in your life. Uh, things you learn, you know, you need to talk uh, about God with others. Um, that's an important thing, and you need to persist. You need to persist. I like so much that the Lord Himself, you know, came to remind Paul how important that was. You know, don't be afraid, Paul. You know, don't be afraid. You know, keep speaking. Don't be silent. Don't be silent because, you know, there is many people I have in the city. I was just thinking, you know, like when we look to the world around us, you know, like uh, how many people will see, you know, around us that uh, they are there. They need to hear a message that transforms lives, you know, especially in the midst of crisis. You know, that we, we, we heard that, you know, God uses crisis, you know, to transform into beautiful things. But um, to, to, to see this kind of things happening, he uses people. Um, like us, like you and me, people that have been experiencing God, and to to do those things, you know, to start caring, you know, uh, to um, uh, to speak, and we needed to persist. We needed to persist. All right. So this is what I wanted to leave with you this morning. I just want to finish with a quick word of prayer. If you would again, please bow your head and pray with me. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you because your word is so, so clear. When we look to, the, to the, the, this book of Acts, we see so many people being transformed, so many people being baptized, so many people being uh, changed by your word, Father. We see some, some, uh, some people with uh, such boldness, Father, to come and to speak about you. Father, I pray in this moment that you would give us this boldness, Father, that we would be like Paul, that we would care, Father, that whenever we have to speak, Father, that we would just open our mouth and, and, and share the great, great things you have been doing uh, in our lives, Father. And I pray, Father, that uh, you would remind us, like you reminded uh, uh, Paul uh, with this beautiful vision. I pray, Father, that we would be reminded constantly that we should not be afraid, that we should be bold. Uh, even that is sometimes uh, we, we may be scared or uncomfortable. But, Father, I pray that your spirit in us would speak so loud, would touch us so deeply that we would not be afraid. Even we face uh, persecution, if we, even if we have people coming and calling us uh, babblers, and even if we have, Father, um, um, opposition, I pray, Father, that we would have this assurance from you that this is what you are asking us to do in special moments. That's what I pray, Father, in your holy, holy name, be with us throughout the week. Um, gives us uh, strength, uh, keep us um, safe and healthy, Father. That's what I pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. Have a great week. And God bless you.